My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. Thanks for joining us on Transmissions. My guest today is Bela Co. Krompacher, who's written a terrific book, Love, Death, and Photosynthesis, about his time in the late 80s rock and roll underground of Columbus, Ohio, and the tumultuous lives and deaths of his friends, Jerry Wick of the punk band Gaunt and Jenny Mayo Leffel, a talented but tortured singer-songwriter. I was sent the book by the great poet Maggie Smith, who joined us on Transmissions for a few poems back in February of 2018, coupled with music from her friend uh, Jerry David DeSica. Uh, and uh, I read the book and had a tremendous time exploring Bela's world. He's a powerful and very funny writer, the exact kind of guest that we aspire to have on this show. The book is out now on Don Giovanni Records, so head over there to check it out. Um, before we head into the show, though, a word from our sponsor. If you're carrying a credit card balance month after month, it can feel like you're in a never-ending cycle of debt. Upstart can help you make that final payment so you can get ahead. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan, all done online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high-interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score and is expanding access to affordable credit. Unlike other lenders, Upstart considers your income and current employment to find you a smarter rate for your loan. With a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. You can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash aquarium drunkard. That's upstart.com slash aquarium drunkard. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. So if you want to get ahead, go to upstart.com slash aquarium drunkard today. All right. Here we are with Bela. Thanks so much for tuning into Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. I'll speak with you more on the other side. You do something in this book that's really interesting. You bounce around chronologically, uh, and and the chapters don't stay in one place. You know, they they interpose all of these different time periods. What was the you know what 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 necessitated that? You think? Um. Well, one, I, I want to thank you for, um, for, uh, you know, enjoying the book and, and also sort of understanding, you know, when, when I wrote it, I, it wasn't, I didn't, I'm not a big fan of, as somebody who like when I was younger devoured music biographies, um, I'm really not the biggest fan of reading about music, if that makes sense. And it's, it's kind of weird too, because, um, even music, documentaries some of them are really hard for me to watch and reading some because i it, i have such an, an emotional core of me that um maybe identifies with so much of it that sometimes i don't even like to go there even for pleasure sure um to so one is even though the mu the book is about music it's it's i think more about emotions and the people 
um, that I knew. And I'm so glad that you picked up on that. Um, in terms of, of how it was structured is one is I didn't set out to write a book. Um, and since I'm not a writer by trade, um, I'm a social worker now. Um, when I write, I have to sort of grab bits of time to write. And so one of the blessings I think of, of doing that is being able just to write whatever I want to write about. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and what I realized in this process of two of, of laying the book out, um, was, and I went back and forth with my editor a little bit, um, because she initially thought it wasn't going to work. And then she was like, after she read like, um, one morning she spent with the, with, you know, the manuscript and said, Oh yes, this works. But this idea that memories, time is linear, but memories aren't. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, we remember things or we re recall things, whether it's through, um, you know, a smell or a song or food, those bring back what, whatever joys or, or pain, whatever it is that, that we had. And, and we don't remember a person in this chronological order. Right. Um, so I, I the way I wanted it to work was um, because it, I didn't want it to be a biography biography of anybody, but just sort of an idea of what um, our lives were like during that time. And, you know, e even a sense now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's, that makes, that makes sense. And I think the, yeah, I, I love the point you made because we don't remember people, uh, in a line like that, you know, we remember moments, we remember things, you know, we remember conversations. This book, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I felt like there was so much vivid, um, you know, dialogue in, in, in a book like this. That's, you know, uh, so crucial because it, 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 because it does, it makes it feel like you're, you're a bystander in it. And, and there, it seems to me like you've always felt, despite the fact that you're deeply involved in music, despite the fact that you've, you know, started a label that you've built so much of your life around music. You, you say early on in the book, you never wanted to be like the sort of person on stage. That wasn't exactly what you were, that wasn't what you wanted. And in a weird way, the book works in that way, you know, even though it's obviously extremely first personal as well. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Talking about these really incredible moments, but the scene setting is, is, is really quite uh, vivid in this book. And I, I liked that. Uh, thank you. I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't have the best memory in the world, but I do, um, you know, my, my partner always likes when I tell stories um, in her kids really like when I tell stories about my grandmother and stuff was, I think she's in the book, you know, yeah. so some of her, her dialogue um, because I remember the conversations. I, I don't remember years. Like I'm sure there are, there are chapters in there <laughs> where it's not the right year, but I remember those conversations. It's, it's like, you know, when, when we talk with old friends or whatever, we have these, we really do have these vivid memories of how, of what those comments were, those jokes, um, or what people said to us that, that were touching and, um, I did try really hard to capture that and I didn't, you know, I'm a very stream of conscious writer mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm an undisciplined writer that, that probably comes out. <laughs> um, like I, I never learned in, like I took one, one English course in college. So, sure. um, yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, my memories of, of those people who are, who I, you know, write about in the book are, you know, there's some very sad memories, obviously, but there's a, a lot of humor. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> and I, I don't think you get that unless you have dialogue, right? Like, you just don't. Right. No, for sure. For sure. I mean, although I think that maybe one of the funniest lines in the book, it was for me, wasn't actually a piece of dialogue. I don't even remember exactly what happened in the chapter, so forgive me, but it ends with you saying something along the lines of like, so I got stuck in a traffic jam and slowly pissed my pants. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Truly, 
like I, I mean, obviously, I identified so much. I, everybody identifies with those sorts of things, but, um, but yeah, you do an incredible job keeping it. Uh, there are some really heavy parts of this book. Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a painful book a lot of times, or a sad book. But yeah, it's absolutely funny too, and that's like it, you know, it's that's what you you have to have that balance when you're talking about life you know because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because yeah some of the most crushing moments are also some of the most hilarious moments in our lives it's just it's just true you know and jason I, that's so funny that or coincidental i shouldn't say funny it's coincidental that that you were that you mentioned that because i was when i was driving this morning i was thinking of like the funniest people I've ever met yeah. are people that, that uh, feel very deeply. Yeah. You know, like, um, you know, for instance, like I, I mentioned my partner, she's like one of the funniest persons I've ever met, but you know, she's a writer. And so like, that's her job is to feel deeper than anybody else. Yeah. And, and Jenny was, Jenny and Jerry were hilarious and, you know, I've been told I'm funny as well, but there's also like this deep wound right. within us. So, you know, you either have two ways to live your life that way. You can either, um, because this core, uh, because this core part of us, this is my social worker, my counselor coming out, because there's this poor hurt part of us that's very old um, that doesn't trust, you know, we, 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 and I, t- I talk about it in the book, like we don't trust things or, or family or whatever it is that, that, that we grow up with. And so in order to gain somebody's trust, either you're going to fucking isolate for yeah. the rest of your life or you're going to make people laugh and want to be around you and you're going to learn how to be charming. Right. And as you're developing that skill set, as you, you know, for me, you know, mostly as a, as a youngster, um, there wasn't this conscious decision like, oh, I'm going to end up being charming or funny or whatever it is, or be able to make light out of the most painful situations. Um, but you end up growing and developing those skills. And I especially think about Jenny, like when she was homeless or when she was in the hospital, she was making everybody laugh. Yeah. I mean, just looking at the absurdity of her situation and the situation around her, even when she was homeless on on the streets and living in homeless camps, she had re- she had this ability to sort of remove herself from that situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's one of the the things is as difficult as life is that it really makes it interesting and. Um, I, I will, it, it, it just makes life worth living in a way, right? Well, yeah, yeah. You know, so I didn't know, uh, I had heard some Gaunt stuff before I listened to this record, but I didn't actually know Jenny's records very well or her music prior to, mm. to sort of being introduced to her through this book. And, and yeah, I listened to that collection that uh, was either reissued or released earlier this year. Um, and her songs are so funny but just so brutal you know too and uh and and you know at one point in the in the book you you talk about meeting Lou Reed and i think about like a quality like that because Lou Reed's discography is alternately the most hilarious thing you've ever heard the most absurd and ridiculously offensive or juvenile at times sort of like puerile really there's that, you know, right next to like the most elemental cosmic truths, you know? And it's like, that's what we, I mean, if you're a certain kind of person, that's what you look for in art, you know? And of <laughs> course, that's what you're also going to look for in people, you know? You know, I, I guess. Yeah. 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 It, it's it's um, coincidental. You, mentioned louis like i played legendary hearts this morning oh, that's great um, that's great i just mark Marin tweeted something about uh is street hassle the best lou record so i went back and checked out street hassle 
Street Hassle, the song, is definitely one of the best Lou songs. The album almost suffers in comparison for me. But yeah, Lou is, is the best. Legendary Hearts, incredible. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I would, that's, it's funny that you mentioned Street Hassle because I think that's his best record of the 70s. Yeah. That or Berlin. Sure. Um, and actually, it's weird. I'm not a big Transformer fan. That's actually one of my least favorite. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Um, I I hear you for sure. But so, I, and and I know like like we went back and forth like on Twitter or or sending messages like those '80s records are so important for me. Oh yeah. I mean, one is like it's like when I discovered them, but um, those those you know from the Blue Mask up to Mistrial, those you know. Street Hassle, uh, not Street Hassle, new, new Sensations, yeah. um, Blue Mask, and Legendary Hearts. Those are just amazing. Again, simple. For me as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, hearing um, somebody just sing about, like, riding their motorcycle out and eating a hamburger. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know people don't think that's a punk rock record, but the idea of being able to fucking pull that off yeah, well, without any mythology, right? Right. Um, which, you, which just, so powerful. Yeah, no kidding, right? And it's, it's, it's so mind-blowing because the punkest thing Lou could do was be a square for a while, in a way. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. that is the funniest and most, like, brilliant. You know, we had uh, Tom Sharpling on the show, and and... We talked a little bit about Lulu, you know, his his final album mm-hmm. with Metallica mm-hmm. and and just about how, you know, uh Sharpling talked about how he he dismissed it out of hand, you know, when it came out and sort of just like did a real surface read on it. I certainly did the same. But the the funny thing about an artist like Lou, at least as I mean, is that those records that you thought weren't any good at some point almost inevitably end up being the ones that you think are the best, you know? And it's like, yeah. it's that way with Dylan too. So often, you know, uh, oh, so, yeah, like uh, street legal is my favorite Dylan record, which is such a great record. But, but when I, when I picked it up or whatever, people were like, yeah, this is minor work. Like, you know, the definition yeah. of minor work and on the beach too. Like now everybody loves on the beach. And I remember like the that yeah. Rolling Stone record, that David Marsh book, like he gave, both those records like two stars well yeah right and then now you look back and it's like the ditch trilogy is peak neil like it never gets <laughs> yeah. better it never gets weirder it never, never and i mean when i say weirder neil has records that might sound weirder of course but at the same time i'm saying like deeply just like his refusal to be you know what it was that he was supposed to be you know uh, but yeah, so, so, so when you look back, you write beautifully, of course, all throughout the, the book about your relationship with music at different times. But, but of course, when you look back on sort of your teenage years, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the record collection and tape collection that, that Jenny encountered, um, what do you think if you, if you had to put your finger on what it was that maybe ran like a thread through all of that stuff? Do you have any sense of what, what it might be? <laughs> Um, Jenny was, was interesting because, um, I had, um, sort of grown up all over the Midwest and Eastern seaboard as a kid. Like, um, I went to 10 schools, so, um, and no military, just a lot of, um, my mom was involved in different relationships. So we lived in, on Long Island and we lived in Youngstown, we lived in Virginia, but primarily, um, up until high school, I lived in Athens, Ohio, which is a college town. So I was, I was exposed to, you know, like I did hear, I did have Ramones records when I was 12 years old. Um, and being in that college scene and then being transplanted into this very rural, rural, like you know, Trump country yeah. where Jenny was. So at that time in, in the, you know, early to mid eighties, you had the the exposure that kids had was was radio it was mostly classic rock radio so it was like scorpions and def leppard and yeah and that sort of stuff and so but when she met me because she was she loved music she had this really 
amazing ability to just create melodies, kind of like Bob Pollard. Yeah. You know, especially younger Bob Pollard um, before, you know, the prog Rocky stuff, but just, and, and this, this idea, she, she was really a lazy songwriter, um, like, you know, and she would say that I would, I, yeah. I would say, you know, you've got, you've, you've created this beautiful song, but you, you put the bare amount of lyrics in it. And she's like, you know, Lou Reed doesn't always fill his songs with a lot of words and, and Pollard doesn't like it gave her this excuse not, not to work hard. Sure. Um, so I think when she discovered my record collection, which was like for her, it was probably like a technicolor kind of like, Oh, wow. Um, the, the thing for me about listening to, to the kind of music I listen to, especially, you know, rock or pop or whatever you want to call it is, is that melody. Um, right. You know, even like when I listen to can, like my favorite can songs are like mother sky and like, like I, I do like that. Right. But yeah, but I, I like something I can sing along to, which I still think is the hardest as somebody who's not a musician is probably the hardest thing to create. Right. Um, right. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, the thread, especially for me, the music and the musicians I've been involved with, with are always like the song, like the song wins. Sure. The lyrics don't always win the, the, the songs do. Um, and I think for Jerry and Jenny, that was a big part of it too. Right. Um, right. That, you know, especially, I think there's something in there too with, with Jenny, she would get in these, these sort of manic drunken states and she would literally listen to one song for 10 to 12 hours on repeat, whether it was a Paul McCartney song or a Bowie song or a Pollard song. I think there's something in there. There's a, a Columbus band called the wiles, the song, Emily, where, uh, yeah. Literally, I remember like going and checking on her and she was listening to it and then checking on her later that night to make sure like she wasn't dead and she was still listening to it and still drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm like, you can play a different song. She's like, no, this is like, this is all I need. This is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Has it, does it, does it ever work that way for you though? Not maybe listening to one song, uh, for 12 hours straight or whatever. But uh, do you ever, do you ever get stuck in one song for, for a while? You know, it's uh, like, I listened to Van Morrison's wavelengths like twice in a row this morning. So oh, yeah, that's wavelengths is one that I have absolutely listened to four five, six times in a row. It's one of those songs where you hear uh, the, uh, I don't know, joy of existence, like uh, affirmed, you know, that's the way I think it's been, a slightly rough time to be a Van Morrison fan lately. Uh, <laughs> he hasn't quite... I think the vitriol has been m- more vicious in terms of Clapton, but that's for understandable reasons, because Clapton does kind of suck, um, versus Van, who kind of sucks in so many ways, but musically, you know, I, I don't know. Van Morrison was, uh, semi-ironically, I guess the last show the last big concert i saw before the lockdown in las oh vegas my God. in february wow. of 2020 i saw van moore my, my wife becky it was my you know late birthday present and we went to vegas and it was awesome it ruled it ruled you know and then the records that define the early parts of the pandemic for me uh absolutely the uh very cosmic 80s van stuff you know those records are so good immaculate uh speech of the heart i mean uh just all, all that stuff the song rayvon john dunn i think is like uh an and, incantation yeah and that um summertime in england oh summertime in england like it's like, like 15 minutes long it's like holy shit and it's so good the the spirit he was tapped into there like the 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 thing you know to me it's about as good a case as i can make for like real musical mysticism up there with astral mm-hmm. weeks and per, for yes. me personally more enjoyable than astral weeks although i love that too you know yeah, and and I could I can agree with that too. Like I go back to those records over and over and yeah. over. Yeah, but it, it goes back to the thing we're talking about, D- broadly dismissed at the time. I've got, there's a great Greal Marcus book about Van Morrison 
called uh, When the Rough God Goes Riding. And uh, that this era that we're talking about, it's like a paragraph in, at the end of one chapter. And it's just like, and then the record sucked for 10 years, you know, like, or whatever. But they didn't, right? <laughs> no, but they didn't. But, <laughs> so but I can see why he thought they did. You know, I get it. I know we're all, we're all coming from, from this place. But yeah, to me, I don't know. The longer you live, right, the more you're interested in hearing where your artists ventured but I, I, Jason, I think you bring up a good point, though, is that underneath that, we, wherever we are emotionally in our stage of development, again, social worky, of whatever we're looking for and whenever we're introduced to it. So I was introduced to Van Morrison in the 80s, mm-hmm. right, as, as a teenager and Lou Reed, Um and those records were powerful for me because I had never heard anything about it. You know, I got no guru, no method, no teacher before I got Astro Weeks. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I got it when it came out. I bought, um, I got Wavelength, like when I was in high school, you know, yeah. 82 or something. Um, so I think it's easy. So it's So it's like, like if a Steve Malkmus record comes out now, and I don't listen to his solo records very much, um, like in my mind, emotionally, I am comparing those to his records to Slanted and Enchanted, right? Right. Yeah. And so I think I think for me as a as a music fan, I have to be mindful of not comparing, which I think that old guard does. And what I think what what people lose too is the growth of some of those artists and as somebody in recovery right. of somebody who's had like spiritual searching and just looking for some calm in my core, those, that music, um, you know, and, and to like talk with Nick Cave, I like, I love his sober records more. I mean, I can appreciate birthday party, but let's just face it. I'm not going to listen to birthday party ever. Right. At right. this point in, in my life. But, you know, to hear him sing about his struggles, his spiritual struggles, or having some um, acceptance, that is that is really important for me. And what I, what I, what music and what like rock and roll always provided me was this adult way of feeling. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not just, it's just not like teenage, bam, 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 I got a fucking hard on. You know, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, which I'm sure is that somebody wrote a song called that or something. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, t- t- well, a song called Teenage Hard On. That's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's 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 like, yeah, I, I don't know. There's that's that's the spiritual basis of so many songs. I do think about the I mean, you talk about seeing Nirvana. There's photos of Nirvana in here and that that, you know, one thing that I like about the book is that you do get to engage one of my favorite musical conversations, which is that idea of, you know, Kurt Cobain committed suicide, you know, and he cited the Neil Young lyric, you know, is it better to burn out or fade away? And I heard that cited so many times as a a kid, you know, and I heard Mm -hmm. it in, you know, movies, and I I heard it as, like, I, I, I also... Uh, being you talk about, I think at one point you say, uh, when one grows up in Ohio, one has the feeling of being the underdog. I, I feel that way too about where I'm from in a weird way. You know, Arizona, this like kind of weird. Everybody dismisses us as a right wing <laughs> fever dream because we are that, but other stuff too. You know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know. So, so I, I think about that. I think about the people who I encountered in the music scene here. You know, people who. Uh, I, I recognize more than passing similarities in, in your book with people I've known. I think a lot of people will feel that way reading this book, you know. But um, I think about how that that spirit of burning out or fading away got into so many people's heads, and they didn't know how to reconcile the fact that in a weird way, I even when I don't like Neil Young's albums now, I'm so happy they exist because mm-hmm. because all these years later, Neil Young's still making albums that he wants to make. Um, 
And to me, mm-hmm. like, even if I don't like them, and maybe one day I will, maybe one day I'm going to be talking about how those are the good Neil albums, you know? It's the post-David Briggs stuff that's so good. You know, I don't know if I'll really say that. But yeah. um, but still, I'm glad that the possibility's there, you know? That that's how I'm going to mm-hmm. feel about those mm-hmm. records one day. Because it's better to stay alive than it is to die. If you it, can, you know? It is, and... and I, I remember reading something um, like a Pete Townsend thing talking about Kurt Cobain's death. And he said, I wish he could have found the piece that I found. Like, I wish he could have gotten yeah. sober. Um, I'm, I don't know if that's something I wish. I, it's weird because I am a substance. I have a you know license to, to I'm a substance abuse counselor. Well, sure. where, and and my, my idea is, is you know, as a person, I, my, hope is that people don't have to use any intoxicants but um but that's not like how i live my life right so it's not that i wish that kurt cobain or so many others who overdosed or committed suicide could have found sobriety because i don't think it was his drug addiction that killed him i think it was depression for sure um but i do wish you know that he could have had some peace but I I know I'm getting a little off tangent, but as somebody who's, who's really lived with depression for, you know, that's why I drank. I realize that now that's why I've had a variety of the issues that I've had in my life is that, is that searching for intimacy and being comfortable with it and, and living with depression of somebody who's struggled with thoughts of suicide for his entire adult life. Um, that getting to a point of acceptance and appreciation is what I wish everybody that I come in contact with, the clients I work with and the way I, I raise my kids, um, those who I love yeah, in, in my life. Yeah. Uh, I think we get so hung up on um, when people our idols have substance abuse issues or whatever. We, we, we can glorify those, but then at at the same time, it's this idea of, well, if they just didn't use drugs, everything would be different. And, and I think Jenny's story is very much like Kurt Cobain's. And of course she was never famous or, or whatever, but the fact was what was a struggle for me and my own journey in recovery was this idea for many years of that, if she just went to AA, right. Um, but with my experience now knowing how she lived her life, um, that was her decision and that her, her mental health issues were much more severe that, um, when I hear somebody who's committed suicide, uh, I try to make sure that I, I come from a place of acceptance for them yeah, and realizing that people who get to that point, they just feel different than what normal people feel. The, 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 what's, what's really interesting about people who have depression, especially who have substance abuse issues, issues is that we we actually feel our physical environment on a cellular level differently. Yeah than other people. We process information differently. Right. Um, and I don't think people understand that. I know I kind of got off, no, off topic there. You didn't there, get off but. topic there at all because because that's what we're talking about. And it's it's that glorification of this stuff is is in some ways it's accidental. In some ways it's understandable, you know, because mm-hmm. because the art does flicker with this intensity that is that you know true you know it's a real thing um Mm -hmm. and i think about that and i think about what you're saying uh, that the acceptance in the book allows it the kind of grace it needs to tell this story i think and i think that the acceptance you know and i also want to make a quick point because it's an audio medium but when you said uh feel you said normal people you used air quotes Mm -hmm. uh the listener needs to know that uh you didn't use normal as if you know that's a real designation because what we of course understand is who who's normal you know nobody is normal um Mm -hmm. normal people are people who suffer from from all sorts of things too you know so it's a it's a it's a true thing that you're able to explore uh jenny's condition and jerry's condition you know because he died uh 
he died i think you say he died the death he might have wanted if you had asked him you know in a weird way Mm -hmm. because it's this like tragic but also darkly comic situation where he is balancing a pizza on handlebars and gets hit hit by a car you know uh, on a bike you know yeah it's just but all that is explored with a way you it's you didn't write a preachy book you know um and I don't imagine you would want to write a preachy book. Nobody wants that. You're just trying to accept and write about what happened. It seems. It seems to me. Yeah. At least, you know. Yeah. That. It, it, thank you for for recognizing that. My my daughter read it. She's 15, and I she she um, I came home one day, and she started reading in the morning, and I, I got home later in the afternoon. And she had just finished it, and she was like um, sitting on the heater, and she was crying. Hmm. And she's like, dad, your book is, is really sad, but it's really, really funny Mm. too. Um, and I was like, well, I'm one, I appreciate you reading it. (laughs) Right. Like, yeah. But I, I, I said, you know, honey, that's what life is. Right. Like, right. Right. Like we're all, we're all going to die. We all come in the world alone. We're all going to leave alone. Um, and we, we, we carry, we carry everything from our past and generational past with us. And it's like, we're just collecting things as, as we go, Maggie and I were talking about that the other day, like, like, like we just, the minute we're born, we start dying, which is, I know it's a cliche, but like, I mean, yeah, it's, it is it's true. so incredible because we collect these things and we're giving all these other experiences off and, mm-hmm. and learning how to appreciate and enjoy them. And, and for me, the trick is, is trying to really understand that, my experience aren't singular to me. They are, but they're not. And the power of laughter and the really the power of music, because I can honestly say the most comfortable I've ever been in my life, probably even more than, you know, when, when I'm, you know, making love or whatever is when I'm listening to a fucking song. Right. 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 And, and and there can be something so magical, like when you're at a show and you're all experience the chorus, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> or or it, it, you know, speaking of Kirk, Kirk Cobain, it would be it, what's so sad is when people commit suicide is that that's the thing that's the first thing we remember them by. Yeah. And not not like all singing along yeah. to. Right to lithium or, or or whatever it is of like jumping up and down in unison of right. Um, there's this bat song called uh, "Dancing Dancing as the Ship Goes Down." Do you know that song? I don't know that one. I I don't know the bats as, as well as I should, down. but I will. Oh, that song! So I think about that song. Yeah, um, "Dancing as the Boat Goes Down." It's such a great song, but I think about that all the time. Of like, right. That's what we, I mean, yeah, for sure. And that's what, you know, that's the best music does that. The best art does that. The best stories do that. We're, I mean, let me. The best people the do best that. The best people do that. <laughs> that's right. It's true. It's true. And, 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 and being able to recognize that, that value and, the, and, the, and those best moments of them, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in, alongside the their struggles and alongside their pains because mm. all of it is what makes them who they were and who who we are you know it's yeah it's all it's all it's all in there i gotta ask though you know 15 year old daughter reading the book i mean was there any part of you that was deeply mortified no 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 that's no, beautiful no, no, that is so beautiful and i think would not be the case for so many people she she said um, I was like changing a record. I was getting up a cup of coffee and changing the record the morning she was reading it. And she goes, "Oh well, this is interesting." And I was like, "What's that?" And she goes, "Well, reading about your dad getting blowjobs while he's standing in front of you drinking coffee, you know, putting on a reggae record." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, you know, it's, I mean, it, people do that. Like, well, you know, I mean, she's yeah, for, for sure, yeah. for sure, for sure. I, That's beautiful, though." Uh, um. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't. That's that's my family though. That is like we. Yeah, for I, and I don't know if this this if this is in there, but I had this. My grandmother was Hungarian, and she was a, a character. Um, and my uh, uncle Peter, um, who just he just passed away last week, but he was a very important uh, in my life. But incredibly funny. The whole family was funny, but he kind of like would sometimes go off the rails and, 
and she said to me one day, she said, Bela, you know what happened to your Uncle Peter, why he went so crazy. And I was like, no, Grandma, I don't know what happened. She goes, you know when he had that vasectomy? And I said, yeah. And she said, you know, they, they tie that up in that stuff. It can't get out. <laughs> and I think it went, it goes to his brain and it sits in his brain. And since he had that, he's been crazy. So I was like, Grandma, are you saying yeah. he's got sperm on the brain yeah. and that's why he's crazy? Yes, that is why he is crazy. Right, and right, so, right. So I would tell that story to my kids yeah. because it's funny. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's where we come from. Like, yeah. Um, this is, so, it's, it's life. It's like you said, this, it's all, it's all in there. It's all in there. And you know, what else I want to say is that you deliver one of my favorite recent descriptions. I don't know if this is the same daughter. Uh, who, do you only have one? Do you have just one daughter? I only have one. Okay. Yeah. Then it's yeah. definitely the same daughter, uh, who asks you as, as, uh, a kid, you know, who who god is and and why people believe in him i think is the the question or something like that and and i i jotted down in my notes uh that your res- your response to her is that you don't know and now i think you say god was an action and nothing more and i'm and i'm really interested in in that quote uh and where you come from uh in terms of of sort of your your where you're at now rather in terms of your spiritual journey um well, thanks. Thanks for picking that up. <laughs> um, that's like cat. That's like catnip to a certain kind of you know person. Obviously, I, I always every book should have a description of the author's belie- uh, you know expression of what God is. Uh, I believe you know. Uh, <laughs> well, so I um, I was my dad was was Catholic, and at, at one time he um, after he divorced my mom, he actually became a monk. Yeah. And, wow. And, um, I mean, I've got my own, like, really core dad issues. Um, but so I was raised through him as, as Catholic, and my mom married a Methodist minister. Um, so I had this, like, weird dichotomy. Yeah. Um, and then in, in my 20s, I went to Mass. I went to Mass twice a week. I was, like, the only person in the scene who... And I, it, I really tried. I, I, I wanted to believe, and there's a lot about Catholicism I do like. I like the ritual. I, I love the music. You know, I love choral music. Um, I used to just go sit in the church, in the back of the church, when it was, you know, when mass wasn't going on and just sit there like this. Like, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted. But I also knew when I got sober, that didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. It didn't, it did not work. And and the, you know, my, my program, I was allowed, given the opportunity, given permission, I would say allowed, that's, that's not a good word. I was given the permission to investigate. Um, and then uh, at one point I was in a border, my sister had sent me a card, I was probably about six or seven months sober, and I started reading um, a book on Buddhism. And then it, it like, boom, it hit me. I was like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm not Catholic, I'm Buddhist. So what I learned through that practice, through the practice of recovery and meditation um, is that we are a product, not just of our thoughts, but of our actions. Mm -hmm. And my, um, I think my purpose, I think all of our purpose is to help others because we're all just riding this fucking jalopy Mm -hmm. that doesn't have air conditioning and the window only goes down halfway and it's stuck on um, AM radio. Like that's our fucking life. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to help each other. Uh And, and the fact that, you know, going to church doesn't do anything like God is an action. Uh It's, it's not an idea that if I want to live a life of service or I want to live a life of acceptance, then there's, there's got to be a method to it. I can't just say I have to do it. So whether that's pausing, 
whether that's holding somebody's hand, whether that's um, admitting that I'm hurting or, or, Mm -hmm. or making somebody smile. That's what it is. I don't, I can't get caught up in um, like too high of thought. Like I have to keep it really fucking basic or I'll talk myself out of whatever it is. Oh, for sure. Um, So I hope that makes sense. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's that, that idea of, of, you know, God is in action um, just breaks it down because I could say I'm a Christian. I could say I'm a Buddhist. Sure. I mean, I could say it doesn't mean I'm it. Right. Right, right, right. Actually, what you say matters very, very little. It's, it's, it's how you. It's what you do, of course. Yeah. And 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 learning um, to get sober, I really learned like non-action is an action as well. Like, of course, yeah, yeah. Not taking a drink, right, is is an action. Yeah. Not and get you know not buying something on the internet or not getting lost on the internet or not getting lost with money or whatever that is. Right. Like just being, yeah. Yeah. Being okay with. Yeah. uh, Yeah. You know, at one point in the book you describe, uh, and I believe this is before you had uh, really kind of settled into what it sounds like your current understanding is, but was, was the sort of record store meditation. uh, Was that, uh, that was, that was sort of before you, you were drawn to contemplation contemplative listening you know long before you had ever really s- settled into any of this right yes I, I i had i i remember um when i was around 19 i got this um pergolesi who is an italian composer who wrote really this beautiful piece of music called the Histabat matter which is one of the most beautiful things i think ever written and i remember buying that when i was 19 and listening to it um and just it moved me so deeply um, that, yeah, I, I think we, those of us who feel deeply, and, and I'm, I don't mean to be like, I feel more than than that guy does, like that guy with the big truck. Like, I feel more than he does. Like, I, I have to be really careful with I, that. Yeah, I know. But I just... I know what you mean. I, I have to... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, str- I, I struggle get- with that too in a major way yeah and i and i don't like that about myself sometimes um I, so i have to be mindful of that but i i do think th- my search for calmness or i i won't even say serenity but um like an intimacy with life mm-hmm. that contemplativeness struck me very early and I was able to find that connection through music, through books, um, really at a really, really early age. And then finding the underground scene, the record store scene, um, yeah. helped because even though we would all get together, make small talk, it was the community we were in, really a part of us, I think all just wanted to listen to music by ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> It, it it was even to it's yeah I get I, I get that you know and I and I grew up in record stores I became who I am in record stores yeah or, or at least learned more about who I am in record stores uh which brings me to a question that I that the first question I wrote down actually um what did when it was in its underground uh, incarnation the basement version of of used kid <laughs> records what did it smell like down there um. It smelled like wet records. Yeah. Um, it smelled like sweat and beer. Um, you know, there's that that smell that vinyl that those cardboard uh-huh. you know covers give off. Um, it was a, a funky thing. It was an old building. We had a for a while. We had a Chinese restaurant above us where they weren't very clean. Yeah. Um, so we sometimes it would smell like rats. Um, yeah, w- the, the whole building was filled with rats. I mean, it's funny that that you mentioned. I don't write about that in the book, but there were times like the, at one point this guy um, went back to China for like the summer, but he left all this meat out. Oh my god! And th- there were like we had to call the health department, had to come in, but there were like. You would be at work and like these giant fucking rats would just walk out yeah. into the middle of the store. Gnarly. Um, 
<laughs> so um it stunk yeah yeah <laughs> but uh, and and we didn't have air conditioning so what we would do is we installed a window air conditioner in the back wall so the back room was boiling um right Right, because there was no central air in the, in the building, right. so it was it was funky and wet and damp, and it smelled like old magazines and yeah, yeah. And somehow you wanted to be down there. Somehow, yeah. That you know, every day I looked forward to going to work. It wasn't like work. I mean, it, you know, you're hanging around and listening to records. It, yeah. To me, as as a 53 year old, it sounds like. Um, that would be the last thing I would want to do is sit around yeah. waiting for people to come in. Um, you know, I like having a salary in the sense where I'm not yeah. dependent on somebody buying something. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I think about how, you know, you talk about, so, so by contrast, discount records, which was the first record store you worked at, right? Mm -hmm. I imagine mm -hmm. did it maybe smell a little better? But but not as yeah, fun. It, <laughs> it was um, well. It was it discount was part of the Music Land chain, and so is that. Um, what is that? It does. It does. Is is Fye somehow? A, I don't know if anything survives of Music Land at this point. That was Sam Goody too, right? Sam Goody was Music Land. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the original discount records, like this is. I mean, there's probably going to be like three people who are like, "Oh fuck, I, I remember Music Land the way." So, so discount records was a small chain of stores that mostly sold classical music on college campuses. Mm -hmm. So there was one in Ann Arbor. I think there was one in Champaign. It was mostly in the Midwest. Music Land bought it. So the one it was the one on the Ohio State campus. We mostly sold classical and jazz. Mm. Um, and I started working there mid to late 80s. And so at that time, and the C CDs had just come out. And I don't think people really realize this, but CDs were really um, geared towards classical music fans at first because they could afford it. They were expensive. They were like $18 a piece. Right. It's what they were uh, when they went out of fashion too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. More, they made a more huge yeah, mistake. sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but so it was a corporate store. So, you know, we had to wear slacks, um, dockers, or whatever those were, and a button up shirt. Uh, the manager wore a tie. Yeah. Uh, so um, we had to be mindful of what we played. You weren't going to play the Stooges in there. Right. Um, or, I mean, like you could play REM, but you could like you couldn't play early replacements. You could play "Don't Sell, Don't Tell a Soul," but sure. you couldn't play "Sorry, Mom." <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it was it was nice because it was a record store, but it was oppressive as well. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you talk about spending lunch breaks at used kids. You'd like go from one to the other, right? Yeah, so I actually became the manager at Discount, and supposedly I was like the youngest manager in mu in the whole music land chain. I'm, I must have been eighteen or nineteen, Con probably nineteen. Congratulations, retroactive congratulations. I'm saying now, yeah, thank you. Know, you. But congratulating <laughs> you then. So, so I would go down there and you know buy records, and um, yeah, you know I remember like going down like on, on my lunch break or whatever one day. And then Ron house um, offered me a beer as I flipped through the records, which was like part of me. Like I remember I went home. Like I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm in, I'm invited into this world. Yeah. 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 It's so funny. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember uh, I worked, uh, until very recently for a company called Zia Records. But when I first got started, right, I was, you know, 21, and I would, I would on my lunch break, go over to Eastside Records, which is another store that was just down the block, you know? And they were the... It didn't smell quite like uh, used kids sounds like it did, but it wasn't far off, I would say, you know? And uh, I remember... I would just, you know, walk over from my 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 job at a record store that was much much hipper sounding than Discount to be honest, but still, you know, a little bit more mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, there, there are multiple chains. And I'd go over to East Side and I would just flip through records and buy, you know, one record instead of buying food or whatever. And I remember one time going up to the counter with uh, Black Woman by Sonny Chirac. And I put that on the counter because uh, somebody had told me that was a really good one. And while the guy was ringing me up, his name's Michael, he was like, hey, uh, look for Sonny on uh, Herbie Mann Records too because they're only a dollar, you know? And I was like, oh, Sonny Chirac's on Herbie Mann Records? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, but he's got to be playing real, you know? And he's like, oh, no way, dude. He's freaking out on these records. But they're real he's cheap, freaking you out, know? yeah. And that was the moment where I remember walking back to the other record store like, oh, holy shit, I just got a... I just got like a, that was like a moment. He told me so. He I got a pro me, tip. Like I got, I got a, a pro yeah. tip, you know? And I just remember that feeling. I know exactly what you're talking about. That feeling of like, whoa. Uh, and I know that like, so often people talk about how that era of record stores was marked by snotty, snide, condescending, holier than thou types. And I know that that's out there too. And I know a lot of people have experiences like that, but there was also something about the, that moment of recognition between weirdos, you know, that just was, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I'm sure it's still happening in a million different ways now, you know, but I, but I know exactly the feeling you're talking about. The, the, the camaraderie yeah. of it. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, because sometimes people say to me that they were like, oh, oh, when I went to use kids, you were so intimidating. I was like, <laughs> like, I think I'm the least un- intimidating person. Um, but it, they were like, I always was scared you were going to judge me by by what I bought. And I mean, one is I didn't really care, of course, <laughs> like because it's a it's a business. Yeah. Um, you know, I, like I might be judging you, but it's probably not going to be by the music you're buying. Sure. It's probably by by like whatever what I would think your ridiculous conversation was or, right. or how stupid your boyfriend looked or something uh-huh. like that. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm judging you. It's not musical though. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's not music, but um, you know, uh, um, Bob from pavement and Mike Hogan have this podcast called three songs. Have you heard that? I have. Yeah. It's so good because I, I sent him a message and, and, um, and, uh, we were just talking, we were, they, they were talking about the book and, and it, 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 like I might be on it, but I, I just said, I really appreciate it because to me, it reminds me of that feeling of hanging out in the record store yeah. and just talking the shit because yeah. I, I could see where somebody else would be intimidated because they're talking about a world you don't really know about. Right. Right, for sure, for sure. And it and we're immersed in it, right? Like, we're swimming in that water. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember... A, and it's a conscious decision to it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember friends... I remember friends getting in a in a shouting match once about, about jazz records. I don't remember what... I, I remember, like, I was in the back office, and then I heard, like, slamming, and I was just, like, walked out, and I was like, what's going on? And it was it was literally something like, Ed said that... Django Reinhardt is better than, you know, Pat Metheny or so, some stupid shit. I don't even remember what it was. And I was like, what, you, are you guys jazz fighting out here? Like, we're having physical <laughs> altercations about jazz, you know? But no, I do know what you mean. Like, you're exactly right that there's like a um, choosing, choosing to be there and to say, this is what I'm going to do with my life is be around this, you know, music and and the people who make it and 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 the people who put it out you know and 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 it seems to me like reading back on this book it you know i i i was a little too young to have experienced firsthand the real pre-internet sort of music culture that uh was around record stores cuz by the time i was in it you know that that was already a part of it but it just seemed. Mm-hmm. It just seemed. Yeah, it seems like you did a, a beautiful job capturing a time, and capturing uh, just an era that that had these qualities that we're still talking about. I and mean, we're still talking about records that were made then, you know. And we're still, you know, exploring the ideas that were cemented then. It, this was just a real beautiful capturing of that spirit. I think. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, and I, and I try not to say, I try not to come from a point and 
and I try to do this as a father of saying um, that time was more special. Yeah. Things were different than things were better than it's just what they were. And I think everybody at that age in our lives, you know, late teens, early twenties, whatever that looks like really until we hit our thirties. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just this kind of like, we're like, we are adult children. And I think this day and age we're for many of us, we're adult children until we hit our early thirties. This sort of struggle. Um, of not romanticizing it in a way as things were better. That's just the world that we lived in. Um, and I, in some ways, I think it's really hard. Like I, I look at my, my kids who are, you know, they're on their, I mean, and I can't say they're on their phone all the time because I'm on my fucking phone all the of time, but yeah. of, of you really had like the opportunity to converse and to share physical things mm-hmm. There's something so, for me, so important of, you know, holding, you know, holding a book or holding a record or uh, experiencing talking in real life yeah. of, yeah. of looking at, at person, you know, as, as their non, you know, nonverbal reactions and communication is, um, it's like when we share a meal, right? Like there's, there's this thing that, that happens. Yeah. And I did, I, th- I think we missed that, but I also, you know, want to like not do that. I have to be really careful with my kids too, of um, one, like they're not impressed by me, yeah. which I think is just normal. Like they, yeah. they don't care. You know, like my, you know, my son has like a dinosaur junior skateboard um, and yeah, you know, Lou, Lou Barlow has stayed at our house, right. but like, he doesn't want to hear about <laughs> any of that. Yeah. Like the other day he, he put on a, um, he's like, dad, can I, can I play a song? And he, he does, he, he really discovered like a lot of really cool kind of like indie home, homemade pop stuff. Um, thank God. Cause he's gotten out of the mumble rap. Oh, thank <laughs> God. So, um, but he, he was like, Oh dad, can I play a song? And so he played on um, my bloody Valentine song. Yeah. Which was, I was just like, what the fuck? Right. And, and I was like, oh, this is such a good song. And he's like, how do you know about this? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I so bad wanted to drop my like, yeah, yeah, cool, my bloody Valentine Kevin Shields story on him. But I was like, no, this is a really good song, buddy. Like, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah. That's, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it because, you know, there's nothing cooler than one day realizing. You know that your dad telling you he's cool will never work. No, when you realize no. it on your own, that's when it's that's when it's uh, that's when it means yeah. something. You just got to be yeah. patient. I think you're doing the. Sounds like you're doing things the right way as far as it, it's, it's my it's li- hard. very I, limited experience. Yeah. <laughs> do you have kids? No, no, I don't. No, I don't. Oh, yeah. But I so. but I am one. You know, so I know. <laughs> I I know I know one side <laughs> of it for sure. You know. <laughs> Well, Bella, it's hey, it's been really, really deeply great chatting with you and talking about this book. I really, really appreciate you taking the time and enjoyed enjoyed this. Um, Jason, I want to just say that um, I, I'm very humbled and I'm I'm very grateful uh, and I, humble. I can't think of a better word to use is that that you are so generous with your time to spend with this book. Um, that you read it and you took notes and you get the essence of it. Like that's for me, that's so meaningful. Mm. Um, It's as somebody's put out records by people over the years, this, this idea of like writing this thing and putting it out in public has been horrifying for me in some sense. Like I want people and to know that somebody um, has read it and is pat it gets the passion of it yeah. and gets it is is really just fantastic so well, i yeah my absolute my absolute pleasure and it was it's been really great talking about it and uh, uh deep respect uh and and thank you thank you so much yeah yeah and ho- hopefully we can meet in person yeah I, sometime I, so i'd really like that i'd really like to have a have a topo chico and and talk about stuff yeah for sure okay all right well thank you so much i appreciate it not another bad year Not another bad year Oh no
Thanks so much for tuning in to Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. I'm Jason Woodbury. I write, host, and produce the show. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Sarah Goldstein and Jonathan Mark Walls create visual elements for the show, and our executive producer is Aquarium Drunkard founder Justin Gage. If you want to support what we are doing at Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions, one of the things you can do is head over to wherever you stream the podcast and leave us a rating or a review or uh, click that share icon and post it to your social media page. We count on word of mouth to help us get new listeners uh, tuned into the show. So thank you very much. If you want to take your support a step further, of course, you can check us out over on Patreon where we're dropping all sorts of bonus content and extra stuff like uh, an episode with Nico Case that will air here in the regular feed uh, in a couple weeks, but you got access to it right over there at our Patreon page now. So if you like the idea of bonus access, we're going to be dropping a lot more shows as early listens over there in raw, unedited forms. So uh, check us out on Patreon. That's another way you can support what we're doing. Uh, We appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back next week, wherever you listen to shows, uh, to discuss the 25th anniversary of Secretly Canadian Records and Jag Jaguar with label boss Chris Swanson. I hope you'll tune in. I had a great time geeking out with him about a lot of my favorite Secretly music. So uh, until then, stay safe. Uh, Find me over on social media. Drop me a line if you want to say hi. I love hearing from listeners of the show. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions.